At least I hope this works. I wonder if it only wanted me to authenticate once, just to make sure that the CD workshop was a human being. Yeah, it looks like anybody could have done that, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And YouTube, I'm not finding C Workshop or C Woodworking. It should be C Workshop. You might have to search on like C Woodshop Center. It, it's, it's online now. And uh, the Veneer Workshop is on here also. Table saw safety. Um, Whoa. We might, we might have to turn this down a bit. Or maybe I should just put it like down here. Right, right about there. Yeah. 
That, that sounds good. It, it varies. I mean, today what we're working against is working against the uh, marathon. So you've got to circumvent Champaign-Urbana to get here. So if you're trapped inside the marathon boundaries, you're trapped to one. I mean, there's there's no way out. I mean, sometimes if you get a break, but usually uh, around nine or ten o'clock, about this time, is when the big throng of people are running through town, and so there's no way around it unless you try to come up us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my wife, uh, she's stuck over on the uh, exit ramp to get onto Curtis to come back to our house on the south side of Champaign. And it's backed up all the way up there. She's not too pleased with me because I had to have her run out here to drop something off for me because I forgot it. <laughs> so, so, you know, if not a lot of people show up when I finish early, we can watch the Woodwright shop or something like that. So, let's see, we got a few minutes here. Did you get your bench picked up? Your bench, did you get it taken home? Yeah. Nice. Is that better, sound-wise? Pretty even? As long as I don't get too close to the speaker, we should be all right? Yeah, I think you get pretty close to the Okay. Oh, because you turned it down quite a bit? Yeah, that's not bad. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to look and, and, and see for sure. I Sure. Yeah. Nice, excellent. Morning. Hello. We have a few minutes before we get started. So you've been in before, I presume? Or have you, is it? Oh, okay. Well, excellent. So hopefully I'm, uh, it's not going to be detailed as much as it's going to help to um, help you think about how to plan the shop better. Um, so we'll get more in, in, uh, more into that in a moment. Get this set up. Okay. So you guys may hear okay, it looks like, obviously. How many of you were trapped inside the marathon boundaries? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, that's a good thing. I used to work at Tepper Electric before I started here, so a little over a year ago. And uh, when the marathon started, which was what, this is its sixth or seventh year now, I think? Uh, Tepper Electric is on Neal Street near Green. So it's like right in the middle of the marathon. And I think on average, one to two customers a year on this day at Tepper Electric. It just, you got cut off. So if you didn't get in there before 7 o'clock, you were out of luck. No light bulbs, no fixtures, nothing for you that day. Okay. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Lowell Miller, as you can see on the, uh, the PowerPoint there. Uh, I'm the store manager. And uh, we're going to talk about setting up your shop today and how to hopefully think about getting a, a better workflow, establishing your goals about what you want to do with your shop, uh, the things you're going to make. Um, and we're going to cover a lot of that. We're going to talk about tools uh, that can be useful, you know, and, and what kind of tools you're interested in. I mean, if you're a, a person that wants to do just hand tool work, then 
you know, there are uh, certain ways to go for that if you're just a power tool guy. But I think a lot of us here are going to be hybrid woodworkers where we're going to be hand tools and power tools kind of married uh, nicely to achieve what we want, which is, you know, top quality work. Although we all suffer from, you know, the woodworker's dilemma, which is we're going to always focus on our faults. So no matter how often we make something, we're going to point out how bad it is in one particular area. There's a scratch, there's a dent, here's a crack, things like that. But I think we can work past that with uh, some therapy and uh, you know, a little help. So to get started here, kind of a basic overview as we get going. We're going to talk about uh, goals, uh, discipline, so uh, what you're making. Uh, location for your shop, uh, which is important um, in order to establish um, what equipment you're going to buy um, or what equipment that you should buy, depending on where you're at. And then uh, organization, which is probably the most important part on here. Um, okay, so uh, as far as the goals go, um, Let's start off talking about hobbies. Now, a lot of people that get into woodworking may do so later in life, uh, after they've had their careers uh, established establish themselves in that way, and they've decided they want something to pass the time. Um, now that they're not, you know, working a nine-to-five job or an eight-to-four or what have you, so they they pick up woodworking as a hobby, um, and oftentimes they reflect back to when they were younger. You know, what kind of education they had? Did they take wood shop in, in high school or junior high? Did they do anything in college? Uh, did they do anything on the summers? You know, rough, rough construction, framing, house building, things like that. Um, we also have people that will uh, <coughs> uh, buy or set up a shop for house maintenance and remodeling. Uh, and actually, that's how I started my shop. I bought a house, and I felt like, well, since I own a house, I'm going to have to have some tools. So I started looking at you know tools for myself. And at the time, the store hadn't been established. <laughs> So I couldn't come here for tools, so I had to go to a home store. Um, and I ended up investing in the Ryobi 18-volt system for a lot of my needs. Well, uh, circular saw, drill, uh, trim router, what have you. And it might, I made do with that for quite a while uh, before I started moving on to other tools. Uh, which leads me to my next one, which is um, sorry, there's a light on, a small business. Uh, and what will happen is, from the first two, either hobby or the house maintenance, they tend to lead into the small business. Uh, I know a lot of gentlemen that will uh, get started in woodworking, normally pin turning, uh, that's a big one, uh, making little toys, knickknacks, uh, bowls, things like that. And they'll start going to craft shows, trade shows uh, on the weekends to help support their woodworking habit, uh, which by that time it's more of an addiction than a hobby. And so they've established a small business for themselves to where they can start reinvesting in their shop. Uh, which is an important thing. As you start to grow in woodworking, you start desiring better tools and seeing the usefulness of better tools. Uh, and the unfortunate part about setting up shop in general is that when we first get started, we always go for probably the cheapest tools. You know, had I had, had I the chance to take back all the money I spent on cheap tools and invest in good tools. Uh, I would I would love it because then I could have a, a much different shop set up than what I have now, um, and you know so that's why you know I I started cobbling together my stuff and now I'm starting to rethink shop setup design and and how to approach uh, your basic shop, and then after that we have a large business. Now are any of you here a small business or a large business owner when it comes to uh, woodworking? No, okay. So we probably wouldn't have any large business guys here. They've been in the business since they were in their teens or early 20s, established themselves as an apprentice probably in the trade unions uh, or on a construction crew and have moved up in the ranks and have decided to, to kind of peel off and do their own thing. So they may have a crew of three to four people. Uh, more often than not, it's going to be a, a dedicated building for a shop. So much bigger space than you know most of us are going to have access to. So the first and most important thing is, what do you want to do? Uh, what is your goal? 
I mean, is this just going to be a hobby? You're not looking to make any money off of it. You want to make things for yourself, for friends and family, give things away as gifts, uh, something to kind of occupy the time. And if that's the case, then, I mean, the other, the other things that follow in this PowerPoint presentation can still be important, but you may not have to spend the kind of money you would think to, to achieve the quality uh, that you would want. I mean, you can just take your time, you know, and build little by little, one piece at a time. Uh, and and that's, that's a nice way to go. Uh, as far as house maintenance and remodeling, I mean, it's a whole different tool set. Some of them do cross over into woodworking, but not necessarily fine woodworking. And, you know, since I'm coming from that point, that's where, you know, rebuilding my shop in a way to where I can do more, uh, more or finer woodworking um, is, you know, tougher. Uh, I bought a uh, Ryobi uh, table saw when I first got started. And I, I made a jig to make picture frames, and it worked out pretty nicely, no gaps in my miters. I, I was pretty proud of myself. Uh, but then I said, you know what, I think I need a better table saw. So I invested in a better jet table saw that I could still fold away and move around because I needed it to, to break down. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't made that jig because it didn't match from my original table saw to the new table saw, so I've got to remake a jig, and I've got to, you know, kind of update all the things I would have made or did make for the old table saw to the new table saw. And so it, it kind of, it's a starting over process for me again. So, um, you know, I'm moving a little fast, but the next is discipline. What are you making? And, I mean, sky's the limit, really. Uh, I started making... Um, little iPhone docks, and I can show you one after, the, uh, after the, the seminar here. And so it's a little wooden dock, you set your iPhone in it, it amplifies the sound, and I made them as gifts to get started uh, as, as my small business, and it's grown, you know, since then. I've been featured in articles and uh, things here and there, and I've sold, you know, enough to make tool money, really, to reinvest in my shop. But when people get started, you know, they don't think about goals, and they don't think about what they're going to make. You know, they just say, woodworking seems like a fun hobby, and that's kind of the same approach that I had. And the store opened here, and I came out here with my wife, and I looked around and, and really got a feel for the store, and I was like, I got back in the car, I'm like, yeah, I, I think I want to be a woodworker. She's like, well, why do you want to be a woodworker? I was like, I don't know, it seems like a lot of fun. It seems like a good hobby. So, you know, and little did I know what I was getting myself into as far as woodworking went, you know, because it's, it's an abyss. You can just jump right in and you can just throw money away on tools and items that are unnecessary. Um, when, you know, you don't know what you're making, you just think, oh, that's a cool tool, I should have that. Or, you know, that's a nice set of chisels, I should have those. Or this is a nice marking gauge, I should have that. So having a plan when you get started with whether it be your goals or what you're going to make is going to dictate a lot of the other stuff that your shop that goes into your shop. The layout, um, the tools that you buy, um, and, and how you want to, you know, in, invest that money because that's what it is, is an investment. So as you can see, we have bowls, you know, furniture, pins, what have you. Um, now, uh, how many of you have a lathe or do any turning? Okay. So we got a few turners here. How many people have table saws? Okay. See, a table saw is usually an anchor in a shop anyway. Um, any hand tools, planes, chisels? Okay. So... As you get started in this and what you're making, we'll go through a, a few of these. Uh, cabinet making. You know, essential tools for cabinet making, you're looking at a table saw, more than likely. Uh, if you're uh, lucky enough to get into it and do your research before you invest in a table saw, you can actually make do with a track saw pretty well. And there are a few on the market. Festool is probably the most popular. It was the first one. Uh, in existence. After that you have Milwaukee, DeWalt has one. Uh, we also sell one by Triton uh, as a track saw. Uh, what you get from that is you get the ability to uh, lay your sheet goods out on the ground or on some sawhorses and cut them up and not have to run them through a table saw. Ripping a 4 by 8 sheet on table saw is not an easy task for anybody regardless of, you know, youth or experience, you know. So, and that, that requires those other tools. You're looking at um, a table saw. You're looking at maybe an edge bander if you're going to get into it professionally where you want to put edge banding on the, the cabinets to get them ready. Um, 
and uh, lots of clamps, um, possibly a domino or a dowling jig, something where you can attach them at the, the corners, Craig jig uh, for cabinet making. Uh, furniture making, you know, you may not need uh, the track saw for furniture making. Um, you're probably looking at more band saws, some table saw work, um, uh, drill presses, uh, things of that nature. Some more stationary standalone tools, uh, more of your traditional shop uh, with the power tools. Uh, but also a good combination of hand tools as well. Having a little block plane to knock the corners off or trim up a, trim up a tenon. Uh, a nice set of chisels if you're going to cut mortises. You know, so a, a furniture maker is probably going to have more of a hybrid shop um, when they start to accumulate those tools. Uh, turning is an entirely different beast. Um, you really don't need a table saw to do turning unless you're doing segmented bowls. But you can get by with a band saw and a lathe uh, and, and do a good deal of really high quality turning and not have to invest too much money. Um, I mean, a, a decent lathe, half horse, is around $400. And you can find them used for a lot cheaper. Um, but your real expense is when you come into the, the tools themselves to do the turning. Um, you might be able to find some old traditional turning tools, but then you need a grinder so that you can uh, sharpen the tools and get them ready for, for use, because when they, uh, you can't work with a dull tool. Uh, or you're investing in the easy wood tools, which have a replaceable carbide cutter. So, but it's a completely different beast. I mean, you're not going to set up your shop the same way if you're just doing turning exclusively. You know, if you're just doing pens or small bowls or anything like that. And target and scroll saw. And I put this on here because it's it's pretty unique. Um, you know, a scroll saw, uh, maybe a little disc belt sander and uh, maybe some hand sanding tools, some chisels, things like that, so you can fit them together. Uh, probably a joiner and a planer, too, to make sure you have the same thickness. Uh, but it's, it's so intricate uh, as far as the discipline that when you get into intarsia, you really probably aren't going to do anything else. You're not seeing a guy that does solely intarsia also make furniture because it's so labor-intensive, you know, laying out your, your project, cutting all the pieces, shaping all the pieces, fitting them all together to make a really good uh, piece of work. And then we have you know miscellaneous. Uh, I'm making little iPhone docks um, with power, without power, uh, picture frames, things around my house, but not a lot of furniture yet. You know, that's what I'm, my goal is to get into furniture making, you know, making tables and chairs and things like that. Um, and you know it can it can come with all sorts of things. I know uh, a few guys that all they do is they make children's toys, uh, and they do it for charities, uh, giveaways, sales, uh, things of that nature, uh, and that's all they do, uh, nothing else. And I know a few guys that just you know, like I said do intarsia or turning. And then I'll, I'll probably fit into here, and maybe a few of you will fit into this. All of the above, where you want the ability, the versatility to really go and do any project that you see in a magazine or a book or you hear from a friend or you see you know, a, a sale or an auction or something like that. And that requires um, a lot of forethought because you need versatility for that. Uh, you know, traditionally in our shops uh, we have uh, we've, we've made the table saw the, the crown jewel of the shop. And if someone invests in a table saw, stand like a cabinet saw, I mean, it's going to take up the middle of your shop. You're looking at having at least eight feet in front for the in feed and eight feet in back for the out feed if you're going to do any kind of cabinet making. And then any of the space on the sides. So you're, you're looking at you know, a, a lot of square footage for one tool to take up. Uh, if, if you're savvy or have the ability to, then you may add a router uh, with a lift into that, the extension table so that you can get a little more versatility out of it. Uh, or build kind of a table saw island where you can have a workbench as well. Uh, but really, once you locate a table saw in your shop, everything else is at the periphery. And establishing a good workflow to where every tool is useful um, becomes a lot harder because you, you've taken away so much space from your shop uh, with that table saw. And so a lot of people will have a table saw 
uh, on a, a mobile cart um, or some way to move it around so they can get it out of the way. Uh, so they can do setups, um, assemble their, their furniture, um, finish their furniture, you know, what have you. Um, and that's, once we've, we've figured out what we're going to make, we know what our goal is, whether it's going to be the hobby, the, the home remodeling, small business, or large business, uh, then it's location. And, you know, more often than not, we're going to be, um, well, in the garage, uh, which I don't believe is for cars anyway. I mean, cars shouldn't go in garages. Uh, I, I don't know if I've told anybody this story, but uh, we moved into our house, and I started kind of outfitting the garage for a shop, and it was going to snow. And we had a little Civic, you know, fairly new, no big deal, it ran like a, like a charm. And my wife said, uh, we need to park it inside. It's going to snow pretty badly, maybe some ice. I don't want to have to clean off the car in the morning. So I said, okay. So I moved the stuff out of the way, made space for the car, I pulled the car in, closed the garage door, go to sleep. Next morning, we you know, open the garage door, and we try to start the car. Car won't start. Won't turn over, nothing, right? And it kind of goes, eh, you know, I thought, oh, gosh. Starter solenoids out, alternator, something like that. It's a new enough car I probably couldn't work on on my own. So I said, okay, well, let's get in neutral. Well, let's roll it out, you know, so I have a little more space to look at it and see what's going on. We roll outside. I, I turn the key in the ignition. Starts right up. And from that day forward, I decided there's no reason to have a car in the garage because they're not going to start if they're in the garage. They don't like it. They like being outside. So garage is is the usual location for a shop. You know, uh, whether attached or detached, uh, doesn't really matter. That's where people mostly set up in in their, their shops at. But um, we have a lot of people that maybe they have an older home uh, that didn't have a garage or a carport or anything. They could have any kind of covering where they could do the work outside the house. So then they're looking at, um, well, went forward two on me. Uh, they're looking at the basement or the attic. Uh, and and those, those are tricky spots, you know, because you have to look about how you're going to get material in, you know. Um, how are you going to get machinery in or out, uh, depending on if you have to move or not. Uh, especially big machinery. Uh, I know quite a few people that have bought uh, a new saw stop and they've got to move it down to a basement. Um, it's not, you know, impossible, but it's not easy. I mean, you're moving a 400-pound 400, 400 saw down the steps or up the stairs uh, and trying to find a location for it around corners. I mean, most houses aren't built with having a shop in the basement or the attic in mind. Uh, and then we have outbuildings and sheds. Uh, some of us are fortunate enough to have land or a place where we can have a big outbuilding uh, where we can really uh, think about the layout uh, of the, the shop uh, or even a little shed. I've seen people that have you know, an 8x8 eight eight shed and they have a fully functional shop that they can roll out uh, and they can build pretty much anything that, uh, that you can think of. Uh, I threw this on here, and I've got one more. Uh, spare rooms. Uh, there are a few people that um, they have, uh, they live alone, or they have spouses that are very loving, that allow them to work in the comfort of a spare room, uh, and not the cold, frigid space of the garage like we had this winter. I got very little work done because my garage is not heated, uh, and I'm sure a few of you had the same problems uh, where. Um, you, you wanted to go out and do some work, but it was like 15 degrees and it would have taken an hour to get the shop warmed up. And by that time, you're tired. You'd watch like five episodes of The Real Housewives or something. I don't know what you guys watch. I hate reality TV myself, but maybe, maybe you guys like The Real Housewives. And so by that time, you're like, okay, that's it. I'm not going to work in the shop tonight. So spare room, uh, maybe an extra bedroom, a utility room, some place where you can set up shop. But when you're working in that kind of environment, loud tools aren't really going to fly. I mean, you can't have a, you know, a 15-inch planer and a 6-inch joiner and a table saw running in there with dust collection. You know, if you have a significant other, they're going to pull their hair out. Uh, it's not going to be a pretty sight. And lastly, um, with the locations, we have an unconventional space. Now, I've I've read articles and seen stories about people living in bigger cities that have zero access to a shop, a shop like this, uh, a co-op style shop, um, something of that nature. So they've taken it upon themselves to work right in their own house at the kitchen table. They attach a, like a milkman's workbench to it. 
where they can hold material, cut dovetails, things like that. Um, or they will set up a little bench inside a bathroom uh, so they can you know, get all the sawdust, keep everything kind of clean and the rest of the house uh, and work relatively quietly. And that's probably the, the last area that we would want to think of or have uh, for a shop. But you know, if the bug bites you and you really, really have to do some woodworking, well, you're going to find a spot, uh, outside or inside, bathroom or closet, you're going to find a place to work. And you're going to tailor the work that you do to the space that you're in. Um, and vice versa. So tools and equipment. This is the the heart and soul of your shop here. Um, and that guy's got way more tools than I have in that picture. I don't think I've had space for all those tools. Hand tools. Oh gosh. Um, you know that's it's it's the romantic uh, version of woodworking. Uh, I'm sure all of us have seen or have. I've uh, listened to uh, Roy Underhill in the Woodwright Shop. Um, I, I know that I used to watch him as a kid, and, and I really enjoyed uh, just his presence and his his outlook on hand tools. And he could do amazing things with you know 18th century technology uh, that I can't come close to with you know 21st century technology or 22nd. If some time traveler decided to drop into my lap, I, I'd probably you know burn down my house or something. Uh, but hand tools, you know, it's there. There are a few ways to go. Um, you can go kind of the low cost route, which means you're going to yard sales, you're buying inexpensive hand tools um, from stores, and then taking them and tailoring them to your needs. And so, getting started with hand tools, you you have to have in in your mind which way you're going to go. Are you going to spend a lot of money on good planes? Uh, you can drop three hundred dollars on on a, a Lee Valley. Or a Veritas uh, number six hand plane that's about this long, you know, and that's just one hand plane that does, you know, a few things, but pretty much a specific set. Maybe a little light joining, uh, maybe some flattening, uh, or you can go to a yard sale or an auction. You can pick up, you know, five hand planes for thirty bucks, and then you're looking at a lot of time invested in, in refurbing those planes. They probably weren't taken care of very well. So you're gonna have to clean them off. You're gonna have to to flatten the soles. And you square the shoulders to the sole, um, maybe maybe flatten the frog, you know, take out the chip breaker and get everything tuned up. And you're looking at you know probably a week's worth of work, um, depending on if you work you know a full time job or not, uh, getting that plane tuned up and, and to a point where you can actually just grab it and use it and, and not have to you know think about it too much. And the same with chisels, braces, drill bits. You know everything that you'd use for hand tools, um, and once you get started down that road, there are some really rewarding um, things uh, about hand tools. Uh, the the silence that you're enveloped in when you're doing hand tool work. I mean, you get a nice schnick from the plane. You know, maybe some chopping of a mortise, but you can have a conversation with somebody. You won't be driven out of your house for making too much noise. Uh, a lot less dust. You don't really have to worry about dust collection when you have a hand tool oriented workshop. Um, and really, once you've gotten everything to the point where it's workable, where your hand planes are working well, your your uh, rip saws are working well, your dovetail saws are working well, everything's tuned up. You know, there's very little maintenance. You know, just some little upkeep after you're done with a project, uh, and then you can roll right into your next project. Uh, and your cleanup uh, is is a lot less. And so, to get started in woodworking, to kind of start building your shop, hand tools are a nice way to start if you are looking for a bargain and aren't afraid of putting the work in to to get your tools up to where they need to be. And you know, then you don't have to worry about the other extraneous things, which you know we'll talk about a little bit later. But dust collection is a big one, especially these days. You know, um, they they found any of the smaller particulate, well, from anything really, is going to be carcinogenic once it gets into your lungs, into your body. It can have some adverse side effects. And minimizing your exposure to dust is is a big thing uh, when you're doing a lot of woodworking. So. A hand tools only shop is nice, but a lot of us live in a time where we don't have two or three or four weeks to de dedicate to a project. 
Um, maybe we have some evenings, but we have other things going on. If we have a full-time job, you know, we've got the work outside of work that we may be taking home or the extra hours that we're staying at work these days to, to match our productivity at work and, and help keep up in our, our you know, day, day jobs. We have families we have to take care of, you know, and, uh, and we have friends that we want to see from time to time that may not always want to come into our wood shop and hang out with us while we do a project. Uh, unfortunately, they're probably a bad friend. Get rid of them if that's the case. You know, put on the blacklist. Get a new set of friends. That only one can visit you, and you don't have to visit them. Maybe they'll bring you beer and pizza sometimes too. Uh, but because we don't live in that kind of world, power tools are a really nice resource. Um, and uh, you know, with hand tools, you can get started with just a few things: a saw, a brace, uh, maybe a plane. Uh, a hammer, a chisel, and you can probably make a few different projects without too much investment. Power tools are the same way. When you get started in power tools, really just to make a project, a, a drill, uh, a circular saw, and uh, a sander of some sort, um, maybe a router. You know, Four tools, you can make bookshelves, you can make stools, you can make some rudimentary chairs, you know, and it really depends on your level of dedication getting that thing built. But you can make it just kind of rough, or you can make it, you know, pretty nice um, without a lot of investment. And you know, when I got started, I, I got the 18 volt system, so I had a circular saw, I had a little trim router, uh, and I didn't have a router table, so uh, you know, I was using this trim router for everything. It was a horrible idea, it just a really bad idea. 18 volts. The batteries don't last very long, so it always cut out on me when I was in the middle of like uh, doing a round over on something, and I'd have to wait 45 minutes for my battery to charge before I could come back and finish it up. And it was one speed too, so it was like you know balls to the wall, and there was no like finessing the router bit and not getting any burn in. It was like I had to move fast, or else I'm going to have a black mark all the way down my uh, my tool or my piece of work. So you know, and then. Again, with hand tools and power tools, a lot of you know how your work comes out depends on how much money you're putting into it. Um, with hand tools, you have the benefit of uh, working on the tool and getting it to the level that you want, um, the level of excellence that you expect. You don't really have that luxury with a power tool. You know what you buy is what you get. Uh, it used to be Porter Cable was uh, you know top notch with power tools. But now they've been demoted to, you know, uh, second under DeWalt. So you could go and invest in a nice Porter cable router. These days, you're not going to get quite as much out of it. So you've got to look around and look for good bargains and read reviews and talk to friends before you start making those investments in power tools. Uh, and that's that's an arduous process, especially if you really want to get started working on something. Um, you don't want to feel like you're throwing your money away on these tools. You want to make sure you make a good investment the first time. And that's really the, the crux of setting up shop is you know, making the right decision on your tool the first time instead of making that decision three tools in uh, and wasting all that time and money uh, before you have the right tool. And sometimes that means waiting a little bit longer or making do with something you know, much, much less... Um, are much more inferior than the tool that you want, or finding a way around those problems that you run into. Okay, and now dust collection. You don't really need it for hand tools, but you need something for power tools. Most people are going to have a shop back of some sort. We're probably looking at like a, a Craftsman shop back, you know, thirty to sixty bucks at Sears. Uh, that's going to do a fair job. You know, pick up the dirt. But it's really not going to do much if you attach it to a sander, you attach it to a router. You're not going to get much out of it. Um, I used to have one. Uh, the filter would clog after about 20 minutes. I'd have my leaf back out, blowing out the filter, sticking the filter back in, and then sanding for you know 20 or 30 minutes more before I had to go blow the filter out again. So while I did save money on the vacuum, in the end I'm wasting a lot more time maintaining and cleaning it so I get you know adequate results at best. Uh, but dust collection can be pretty inexpensive, um, you know, depending on how you want to go about it. In my own house, I have an Onita dust deputy on a cardboard barrel. I got the cardboard barrel for free when I used to work at Tepper Electric. I get, spent 40 bucks on the dust deputy 
uh, off of Amazon. And uh, now I've got a two-stage setup. Uh, and then when I invested in Festool, I bought a vacuum uh, to go with the sander. And I use my Festool vacuum as my, my dust collection. So I attached that to my dust deputy, sent a Y off of my dust deputy to my table saw and my joiner planer. And it does a really good job with the joiner. It doesn't do quite as good a job with the table saw because the shroud of the table saw is not very good. And so what you'll run into as you start to invest in dust collection is you may buy a really nice dust collector, but are your tools ready for dust collection? Um, if I put, you know, a, a big one and a half horse Laguna on my table saw, it'd probably work a lot better than with my fast tool. But still, the shroud is minimal. I mean, I think it covers like three inches of the blade underneath, and everything else is open. I mean, most of that's just going to fall to the ground if it even gets sucked up at all, or come back at me as a big dust rooster tail right in my face as soon as I turn on the saw, so I look like I've just been covered in dust right down my middle. So you can go and get a, a pretty good dust collector. We have a Steel City one on the floor. I know you can buy it and used. Uh, our Steel City is about 350, I think, for one and a half horse. It works well on one to two tools at a time. Um, you'll have blast gates. I mean, you want to make sure you only have one line open at a time. But if you find a good deal on a dust collector, I know people that have made them. They just buy a big squirrel cage fan. They attach a hose. They have you know a bag unit or something to collect the debris in, and they've made their own dust collectors. And it just depends on your level of ingenuity and your level of dedication with getting something set up. But it's essential to have dust collection in a power tool setup uh, if you're going to be working in an enclosed space. If you're pulling your tools out to the driveway, Probably not as important. You know, you're going to have dispersal from the wind. It's going to help keep you clean, keep your project clean. Uh, not a big deal. But you, you want something in a power tool setup, uh, especially once you get into the bigger equipment. So let's see here. Um, I'll get into more of the equipment later, but clamps. I should probably have that on here three times because you need three times the amount of clamps or four times or five times than what you usually think. I got started and I got, I think I got some Ryobi quick grip clamps from Home Depot and I got four of them. I'm like, okay, I got some clamps now, right? And then I realized I should probably have about four more of these. And then I got some uh, Rockler bar clamps and I got some pipe clamps. And so I have this, you know, uh, uh, amalgamation or the, this, uh, this amalgamation of clamps in my garage and no four are the same. Uh, because I didn't put a lot of forethought into the class. It's like, yeah, pipe clamp sounds good. I think I'll get some of those, you know, or this bar clamp. But you can't really ever have too many clamps. Like, you can't ever really have too much glue or, uh, you know, rags to put finish on. I mean, these are just kind of staples that you have to have, especially as you get into more of your furniture making. Um, and finishing tools. Um, a lot of us are probably just going to stick with maybe a rag to wipe on stain, brushes, things like that. Uh, but as you move up, you can get just a, a pretty simple sprayer. Um, I just bought an Erlex uh, a few weeks ago because I'm going to be painting my house. But it's a, a sprayer that I can use for fine finishing too. I can spray down you know, lacquer. I can do um, varnish. Uh, I can do uh, gel, oh, not gel stains or gel top coats, but I can do uh, oil top coats. Uh, things like that, no problem, and it's uh, not a big investment. Um, if you get an Apollo sprayer, you're spending seven, eight hundred dollars, you know, just on finishing, and then you've got to learn how to spray after that. Um, but if you don't want to invest in those kind of sprayers, you can get spray spray lacquer from a can, or just stick with brushes. I mean, or wipe on polys, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can get a very nice hand rubbed finish without having to do a lot of investment. Uh, in those tools. And then probably uh, the net, the most important you know, of all these is the measuring, the marking, and the layout. Uh, if you don't have a, a square that is square, then you are really in bad shape. Uh, your, your lines are going to be off by, by degrees, things won't fit. Um, and investing early on in good uh, layout marking tools is essential. Um, Sterrett makes really nice stuff. High quality Woodpecker makes really nice stuff. Um, if you decide to invest in something low cost, uh, find somebody that has something high cost and then check it against it. 
so that you know that what you have is is going to work for you and going to be square. Um, and as far as marking tools go, for the longest time I've had a pair of vice grips and the nail that I had sharpened, and that was my marking knife. And I used it. And I still use it quite a bit for for things, you know, depending on where I'm at. But it worked just fine for me. You know, it was it was nice and small. I had a sharp point on it. I could sever the fibers in the wood as I was marking my line, uh, and it was not an issue. Uh, and then I moved into dial marking gauges, and those are beautiful uh, to use. Very nice. Makes a nice straight line. Easy to sharpen. Uh, but you know, you can make do with a little, uh, and not have to invest a lot. And really, that's that's the kind of point that I want to get across during this presentation is that you don't have to be a millionaire to have a good shop that makes high quality stuff. You just have to think a little bit outside the box and plan your steps out before you make that investment. Um, because I don't think it's essential to have, I mean, I, would I love to have the dream shop? Yes, I would, very much so. Love to have a 12 inch helical head joiner and a 20 inch thickness planer that has a helical head on it and a 3 inch bandsaw and you know, dust collection out the wazoo and a saw stop. Oh, it'd be great, wonderful. Uh, would my quality of work improve? Probably. Um, would I still have time to get in the shop? No. I wouldn't be in the shop as much as I would like still. Uh, so, and then, I mean, after this we can talk more about tools and equipment and we can ask questions and, 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 and feel this out more, but we're going to get into organization. And this is, this is a, a really important part of that because no matter how much money you invest in the tools, uh, how you lay them out, how you organize your shop, is essential to, to making it a work environment where you can thrive. Uh, if you don't have a shop that's laid out for the way you work, you're going to be tripping over yourself and, and going back and forth and wasting so much time getting out tools or setting up tools that a lot of your efficiency has gone out the window. And a project that may, maybe could have taken a week with the proper setup has now taken three or four weeks. And that's frustrating. And sometimes uh, it alienates you from your shop. It makes it not a good place or not a fun place to be in. And we want our shops to be a place where we can be, you know, have refuge. You know, you want to go to your shop, be able to listen to some music, do some woodworking, and not feel frustrated by clutter or cleanup or the fact that you have to do two hours of, of maintenance on the shop before you can even start on a project. Which is my problem, because my wife still thinks the garage is for other things than a shop, like storage of stuff that doesn't belong in the house, that I think we should just goodwill most of it. So uh, we're going to look at a few shops. I, I um, got, a, got a magazine a few weeks ago. Um, it's from uh, Wood Magazine, and they were talking about shop layout. And we have a few workshops here. And uh, I have a little tool on this, uh, this that works pretty nicely, but I think it's a little clunky. So we've got a garage shop here. We have a nine, nine, foot, nine foot wide uh, overhead door. Uh, and this is a really great kind of setup. You can get materials in and out really easily. Uh, you've got a lot of space for your tools. And you've got 23 feet by, oh gosh, I think it's, I think it's like 18 feet here. So it's a pretty average garage, maybe about a two-car garage that this gentleman has set up. Um, but there are a few things that could change. Um, if you look at his shop setup, he's got his table saw and his workbench in the middle, and we talked about that. When you have that investment, it's going to be located in the middle. It's going to be an island that's in your shop. But his milling uh, machines are kind of dispersed. He's got a joiner here, right? He doesn't have a planer that I can see. He's got a drum sander that he's probably using as a planer to thickness his material. It's all the way across the room. You know, just by locating this in a different area, maybe going joiner down here, going drum sander here, right? Uh, he can lay it out and have his lumber rack here. He can take his lumber off of the rack, edge join it, face join it, run it through his drum sander to thickness it, and then he can come to his table saw and he can cut it down to size. And his workflow has gone from here all the way around and he's staying on one side of the shop, and he can move some of his other tools over to here. He can move his bandsaw over, um, he can move his air compressor over, and he can have a little more space uh, on the other side. His miter saw can probably, um, well, the door wasn't there, uh, move over here, but still he could set it up in such a way to where it flowed better. 
and increased his efficiency as he's moving around his shop. Uh, but you can see he's got a good deal of tools in a small, you know, a decent size, you know, garage setting. He's got a miter saw, a drum sander. He's got a nice table saw. He's got his router table there. Uh, he's got a drill press, bandsaw, joiner. So he's he's got a, a little wall-mounted dust collector. He's got a nice a nice setup, but he doesn't have full-on dust collection, which means that if he is doing any dust collection whatsoever, he's taking a hose from this and taking it to each tool as he goes around. So you've got to have a nice long hose to do that. Um, if you're setting up dust collection, we have a seminar on that usually once a year. Um, running piping from a dust collector up to the ceiling and then down to each tool with uh, bl like manual blast gates or automatic blast gates, again, increases your efficiency because once you turn the tool on, that blast gate, if it's automatic, will open up. Or if you open the blast gate and have it set to turn on the dust collector at that time, um, means that you don't have to have a remote or go over and turn on the dust collector and then come back to your tool and then turn off your tool and then turn off the dust collector and go back and forth. You know, and it's not bad to walk around your shop and get a little exercise, but if you're in the middle of a project and you've got a good workflow going, you don't want to be put in a position where you're interrupting your workflow to do all these different processes to go to your next step. So our next shop here, pull this up here, is a pretty big shop, 29 by 23. Um, he's got a double door here, so he can probably get in sheet goods and other materials pretty easily um, right into the shop. I believe in the magazine this gentleman had his shop built separately, so he could put a lot more thought into it. He didn't have to work with the space that he had. Uh, but again, his table saws in the center, right? Workbench located close by. So again, that table saw is an island. You take the table saw out, you've got a lot of space for other tools, processes, workbenches, assembly areas, things like that. And more than likely, his table saw is stationary there. He's not going to move it. Um, he's got a radial arm saw. He's got a mobile table saw they can move out. Uh, maybe he's got a dado stack in there or something like that for the extra. But notice again, let's see, he's got his planer right here, and he's got his joiner right here. So, and his lumber rack. So he's going to do any kind of uh, milling. He's taking his lumber here. He's joining it. He's going to the planer and then table saw. So that's not a bad workflow. Um, as he goes there, he can kind of not go have to go back over himself. Could he locate the planer closer? Yeah, he can put the planer right over here and move those tools to this area. And then it's boom, boom, boom. Uh, and he's, he's minimized you know, his steps. He's, he's increased his efficiency. His workflow is improving. Um, and that's, that's important. Now, this gentleman is working out of a shed. Uh, he is 14 feet by 8 feet. Uh, so he's fit a decent, size amount, a decent amount of tools into this shop. Uh, he's got a nice lathe, uh, bandsaw, disc sander. I think you know, it probably does a lot more turning than anything else, I think what the article was showing. Uh, table saw that he's moving out is probably a mobile table saw. Um, but you can see there is no joiner, there is no planer. Uh, so this gentleman, if he's going to do anything other than turning, he's either going to have to wood milled up at the lumber yard for him and spend more money getting that wood and not having raw wood that he can work with, you know, rough cut lumber, uh, or he's going to have to make an investment in those tools at some point in the future if he decides to move out of lathe work and into more furniture making. Um, or he's going to have to invest in hand tools and also invest the time in learning the hand tools uh, because you can't just pick up a plane and go. I mean, you're going to have to tear out and all sorts of other stuff and hopefully not too much feedback from a, a microphone. Oh, I was about to touch that to make it go to the next one. Uh, and then I think this is our last slide on the, uh, the shops. This gentleman has a nice building, 30 feet by 48 feet. That's a, that's a dream size shop for most of us here. Um, you know, are we going to have the ability to have that? You know, some of us do already. Some of us may in the future. But in all likelihood, no. We're not going to have uh, that ability. And so again, look at our layout. We have a table saw and workbench right in the center of our shop. Um, if, and I, I firmly believe that you don't need to have a table saw to do good work. Um, I plan on getting rid of my table saw. I have a track saw already from Festool investing in a bandsaw, I think 
I could cover everything that I needed to do uh, that my table saw could have done with those two tools and take up a lot less space in my pretty small shop. So uh, looking at his setup again, he's got a nice setup. Um, his lumber rack could be in a different spot possibly, uh, but you know, he's taking his lumber over to his joiner and to, to his planer and then to his table saw. He's actually got it pretty well thought out, uh, but he has the space to think it out. He doesn't have to... Sorry. Hopefully that's better. Uh, he doesn't have to, uh, to, to, to worry about space. He doesn't have to make space for stuff, you know, and have things on mobile carts and have things packed away and they have to pull things out to, to make use of them uh, because he's got a lot of real estate that he can use. Uh, and, and a lot of tools filling up that real estate. I mean, things that we probably wouldn't have. A, a panta router? I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know what that is. Anybody know what a panta router is? Is that a pin router of some sort? A duplicator? Okay. Thank you, Randy. Uh, but spindle sander lathe, mobile miter saw, an extra miter saw. I mean, this guy is living the high life as far as tools go. I'm not, I'm not going to be there anytime soon. So back to organization. Uh, so we, we've, we've looked at the layout and flow um, of that. And, and that really is uh, a big part of your woodworking efficiency is making sure that you can go from point A to point B and not have to move stuff out of the way, not have to set stuff back up uh, to get your project going or completed. Uh, and you know, as, as we get into woodworking, like I said, we kind of cobble things together. I don't think we, we have a clear vision when we first get started. We're just excited at the prospect of getting new tools, you know, and getting started making something and having these big dreams of this, you know, this, uh, this nice kitchen table I'm going to make or this, this nice Morris chair, or this dresser that I'm going to build. And we don't think about maybe the tools that are going into it, how we're going to store the lumber, where we're going to assemble it at, you know, all of that before we even get started with that basic project. Uh, power is huge. Um, when I got started working in my garage, I had two outlets, two. One for the garage door opener, and then one on the wall. That was it. And I was running uh, a table saw, a joiner planer, uh, a vacuum, um, routers, all off of this one outlet. Uh, also a TV and a sound system. Uh, so if, you know, so I had a lot of stuff going out of one outlet, and that's dangerous. Not a very good plan uh, when you're laying out your shop. So if you have the ability yourself to run extra circuits, do. Um, think about, you know, if you're going to have a shop that's strictly 120 volts and you don't need any extra power, or think about, you know, upping the power, you know, running a 230 volt circuit so that you can have access to some of the bigger tools, maybe a three horse table saw if you're doing a good deal of work with hard lumber, you know, like your hard maples, walnuts, things like that, uh, that maybe you wouldn't want to use a lesser saw on or a really big dust collector, or a really big bandsaw if you're milling your own lumber um, so that you can dry it yourself. Uh, so, you, so think about power and think about the layout of the power because as you lay out your shop uh, and kind of get the optimal layout and design for, for your workflow in your shop, you need to say, okay, where are my receptacles going to be at? Are they going to be, you know, down close to the floor, about six to, or about eight inches off the floor, or a foot off the floor? Or are they going to be up about chest height? Um, am I recessing the receptacles into the wall because I have drywall and insulation? I want it to look nice. Or am I running conduit and external boxes for power here? And do I have the available power? I mean, do I have extra circuits in my box? Uh, am I running 15 amp or am I running 20 amp? Um, you know, and, and make sure that you have adequate resources to even run the tools that you want to run. Um, your average joiner is going to be, you know, probably about 230 volts. Average planer, you can probably get a small kind of lunchbox planer for uh, that's 120 volts. But if you go anything that's standalone, it's probably going to be 230. So you you need to have access to more power uh, if you're going to run any of the bigger tools and equipment. And you know, buddy up with an electrician, buy him some beer. Become their best friend so that you don't have to pay to have somebody do it if you don't know how to do it yourself. Uh, I just had more power installed in my garage uh, this winter, thank goodness. 
Uh, so now I can actually plug more than one tool in at a time, and I have to unplug it and put it away before I get another tool out. So that's increased my efficiency as I do my work. Uh, we also have to talk about lighting. Um, my garage, uh, and I, I, I hate to admit this, is poorly lit, especially for a guy who spent eight years selling lighting fixtures. You think I would have learned a lesson uh, or something about this. Uh, I have uh, a keyless uh, socket uh, above my door going into the house. I've got the garage light on the garage door opener. And I have a small two-tube fluorescent shop fixture. It's a um, F34T8, uh, so a fixture about like this uh, above you, uh, above my bench. Uh, optimally, uh, especially since lighting technology has improved, uh, you could do a lot of things if you're starting in a bare bones shop and you you know you can design it yourself. You could go with uh, recessed LED fixtures, so your energy cost is very low. Your maintenance is also very low, and your light output is very uh, very good, uh, and also very precise. And when I say precise, I mean you're getting the color that you're supposed to get, and not a color that's off. Um, and that makes a big difference if you're doing any of the staining in your own home. If somebody else is going to do the staining for you, if you're taking it down to a cabinet shop in Arthur and they're going to stain it and finish it for you, then maybe it's not a big deal. But if you're trying to match a stain and you've got a fluorescent bulb that is a cool white, which is going to be a bluer hue, that's going to change the way a cherry stain looks on cherry as opposed to one that has a warmer hue, a yellower hue. So having a true color bulb uh, in the LED is very nice. And they're, they're as, as true as you're going to get these days or a true color fluorescent. Um, that's also going to affect how you do your, your, your wood matching. You know, uh, your grain shouldn't be an issue, but the color matching in wood can vary you know, greatly. You can have a cherry board that's a very light red, and you can have a cherry board that is very kind of a deeper red, even after you've sanded it. And if you're trying to match those two boards and you have inadequate lighting, you'll probably put them together as a, a front for something like a cabinet. And then once you get out in the light, you're going to see a very big disparity between the two boards. And all that time and effort and energy you put into picking the wood and matching the wood is out the window. Because now your project has gone from looking really good in one spot to looking adequate at best. Maybe your craftsmanship is still high, but you haven't matched your wood grain, you haven't matched your stains, your, you know, your color's off. You're not getting the look that you wanted. Um, and lighting layout is important too. Having really good lighting over your bench area so that if you're cutting a mortise, um, cutting tenons, um, being able to see your line so that you can cut to your line or sand to your line uh, is everything. I mean, otherwise you're going to have to go back and trim and trim and trim and hopefully not over trim to where you have to redo the whole thing. And you don't want to do that. <laughs> That's awful. Uh, so think about that. Think about when you when you pick your fixture. I would recommend if uh, and you can get these for a fairly low cost going with a high output fluorescent fixture. Uh, it's called a T5 fixture, they're normally called a high bay. So the bulb that you would use is an F54 T5 HO. And that you can get in various color temperatures. Oh, of course, yeah. And you're looking at probably a eight or a nine, and and here's here's a, something that people don't think about: daylight, sunlight, which is our, our truest color, is is actually very very blue, extremely blue. That's why if you look tan inside, but you go outside and you look washed out, that's the case. And you know it's just a very blue light. And that's a 5,500 Kelvin kind of light to 6,500 Kelvin. That's daylight. So that's the kind of bulb I think you should probably use. But if your shop is lit in a, a cool white light, that daylight style light, but your home is lit more than likely in a warm, inviting light, not that cool, harsh light, there's going to be a big difference. So maybe somewhere in the middle is a good place to be. 
Eight or nine means the, the trueness of the color, how many CRI that is. And then following that, you're going to have other numbers. You're probably looking at like an 835 or 935 or a full spectrum of one of those. So the 8 or the 9 means color rendering index. So how true is it to true color? 35 is the color temperature. That stands for the Kelvin. So that's 3,500 Kelvin. That's what a halogen bulb is. And halogen is, is, is probably what everybody uses when they're checking their finish. You know, they're going to shine one across the surface, uh, see if they have any particulate that's sticking to the finish, see if they have any scratches they need to get rid of, things like that. But an FD4T5 high output and that color temperature bulb, um, a high bay normally takes four of those bulbs. Each of those bulbs puts out 4,400 lumens of light. So in a small shop setting, two of those fixtures are plenty bright. You should be able to, to, to fill your whole shop with light and feel like you have adequate working light uh, for your shop. If you have a big shop, a 30 by 48, something like that, depends on the ceiling height, but you're looking, if it's an 8 foot or 9 foot ceiling, you're probably looking at, uh, I would say, about six fixtures um, to fill that with light. And that means you have to have power to those lights as well, either a plug-in receptacle on the ceiling or someone to wire in the junction boxes for you, which obviously brings us back to power. But you can't really ever have too much light. Just make sure it's good light that you're getting and not uneven, inadequate, off-colored light. Fluorescence used to be greenish or pinkish in their hue. Uh, LEDs were the same way. Um, when they first started getting into white LEDs, they, uh, you could buy some from some companies and they would, be, they would look green. They would have a green issue or they'd have a pink issue or a blue issue and they weren't really true. Technology has gotten to the point these days where you can replace a regular incandescent light bulb with an LED light bulb and hardly tell the difference. I use a lot of them in my own home. They're great for outdoor fixtures too, by the way. You don't ever have to replace your post light if you have an LED light. You're done and we're having to take the thing off. But can't have enough light. And then... Uh, Let's see. Um, I've got storage on here twice. And uh, there is a big reason for that. Uh, you can't uh, underestimate the value of storage of your tools, of your materials, um, of your finishes, of your fasteners, uh, of anything. Uh, having the space to store all that and keep it out of the way until you need it and having it organized to where you don't have to rip apart 15 different things to find it is so important to making sure that your project gets done on time and adequately. And when you're thinking about storage, you don't have to be conventional. You don't have to stick with a cabinet. Uh, I just got my new version of uh, my new uh, issue of Wood Magazine, and there is a guy who has his basement shop. He's got the joist above him. They're opened up, not drywalled in. And he built a rack that has uh, two bars coming down and three shelves, and he can lift it into the joist and put some toggles on it, and it stays up in the joist. And then when he needs it, he just rotates the toggles, it comes down, and he's got three shelves that, has, that have finishes, have nails and fasteners on it, and when he's done with it, he just puts it right back up. So all that unused space that he had uh, in his basement shop now can be used for all sorts of storage that he doesn't have to put on the wall or in a cabinet under his bench uh, or in a closet or somewhere else. Um, so when it comes to storage, you know, always be watching, always be listening, always be looking for innovative ideas that can help you store all those items. Uh, when we get back, when we, we talk about shops, um, I'm, I'm in a small shop. My garage is... 19 by 21. Half of that is storage for stuff that shouldn't be in the garage, like I said. The other half is my shop. So I don't have a lot of space where I can just store everything. So I've got, I've got to think about it. For my lumber rack, it's on the ceiling. I took, um, I took some floor flanges and uh, half-inch pipe. I attached the floor flanges to the stud. 
uh, I put some PVC uh, over the pipe so it wouldn't mar the lumber. And I've got two of these set up on my ceiling. And I just take my raw boards and I put them up there. And for the stuff that I've already milled up or I'm already to use, I use a lot of block stuff. Uh, I've got it on a rack uh, on the wall closer to me, a little shelf unit closer to me, so I can reach up and I don't have to go up and grab it. Uh, but you know, I'm not using the ceiling for anything, so I might as well use it for something. And lumber storage is a great one. Um, you know, having cabinets that are versatile, because your shop layout could change as you acquire more items. Uh, currently, I have a 10-inch joiner planer from Jet. It's okay. Would I like something better? Yes, very much so. Something that I don't have to spend four hours trying to get the knives perfect in it uh, because I, I hate straight knives. They're the worst. So, but I'm going to change that out eventually. I'm going to go with standalone tools. I'm going to go with possibly a six-inch benchtop joiner and then a 15-inch benchtop planer. Well, I've got to have a place to put those. Where am I going to store those at? You know, I've got to have a place to put them when I'm going to use them. So I need to have a bench top or a space to put them. So, you know, there are um, people that have gone out and they've got more ingenuity than me, it seems, and have built a cabinet that has a turntable on it, essentially. So they've got one mounted to one side and one mounted to the other, and they remove a, a, a locking pin, rotate it, planer's ready to use. Ready for the joiner? Unlock the pin, rotate it, joiner's ready to use. And so, uh, I, I, I don't say this you know, to make you buy more woodworking magazines, but find a woodworking magazine that you like um, and, and get it you know, or have access to something. And look for those innovative techniques, how they store their finishes, where do they store their finishes, uh, and, and, and look for versatility in your storage. Uh, I use a French cleat system for my wall storage so that if I end up moving something and I want to have a better spot for it, I can just take it off of one wall and I can stick it on the, another wall. Uh, I know a lot of people that have, or I've seen a lot of articles and I know a few people that have built a wall rack, uh, just it's a four by eight sheet of plywood they put on the wall and they attached cleats to it. And so they've got a, a very versatile storage system for their measuring and their marking tools, their hand planes and chisels, their mallets, draw knives, scorps, what have you, um, dovetail saws. And they've got tills and um, holders for all these tools that they can just move around all over depending upon how they're using their shop and what they're using at the time for that project. Their most used tools being right at, within arm's reach, the lesser used tools being up higher. So um, that is it. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming to the seminar. I knew it's not two hours. Um, I, I wish I had more filler or a song and dance, something I could throw in here to, to keep you... Uh, you know, happy and occupied, but I don't. So you can have some view always in nature. But do you have any questions uh, while we're here? And I have a, a captive audience, captive enough at least. Go ahead. Whatever question you have. You mentioned shop magazines and so on. My daughter got me into this. Uh, she's a big Pinterest fan. Sure. And I thought Pinterest is crap ideas for my wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a one that you can get a link to where basically it's a circular it's built on a Lazy Susan plan where you actually have like four tools put on a Lazy Susan but it's built on a corner cabinet. Sure. And you just simply undo the, the, the uh, barrel holes and just turn it around and you got access to a separate tool, that kind of thing. When yeah. You're yeah, Pinterest is a, is a great resource, and it's funny because when Pinterest first got started, it was, it was dominated by probably hipsters because they already know about it before everybody else does. That's why they're a hipster. Um, and then uh, you saw uh, probably a lot of craft people, and, and I, I, I say housewives, but you know women in general probably uh, getting on Pinterest. And then I was convinced by my wife to do a Pinterest account because 
she wanted to know what I wanted for Christmas. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll do a Pinterest account. I actually I haven't curated mine very much. It has this watch on it, has some boots that I got for Christmas, uh, and maybe some sunglasses. That was about it. That's all I needed. But it is a great resource because a lot of guys have gotten on there and they've traded ideas. It's a nice trading post for ideas, like uh, like the gentleman was saying. So Mr. Holmes, right? Uh, uh, so you can go on there and not only find good shop plans, but find good project plans uh, and good ideas to kind of stimulate you as you look at the projects or the things that you want to do if you haven't set up your shop yet. Uh, because you need to, to enjoy what you're doing in the shop. And if you're not enjoying it, then there's really no reason to be in the shop. So find something you like to do. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Feel free. I mean, you can ask me now or you can ask me after the, the seminar. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm here till 3, so you've, you've got me for, what, four more hours? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, not entirely. I was able to, to shut off my dust collector before uh, before it went too far. I, I uh, made the mistake of not paying attention and opening up blast gates before I turned on my dust collector, and all of a sudden I start I, I saw my Onita dust heavy start to, to to shrink down in size because the barrel was collapsing underneath it. Uh, so I turned off in time. And I've had the barrel for three, four years now. Uh, I put duct tape on the places where they had a little bend in them. Uh, it seems to work pretty well still. And I just emptied it the other day. So yeah, it's, it's, it's holding up pretty well. And do you like the separators? I do. Um, there are a lot of versions of them. You're going to find the Vortex version that we sell here that can go on a five-gallon bucket. You can find the Onita Dust Deputy that's really highly rated. There's the Clearview Dust Collection System, also very, high, very highly rated. And there are varying sizes. You can go up to you know, something that's like six feet tall uh, that's going to separate particulate. But that's for a big shop. You know, most of us probably don't have room to store it, number one, or the tools to, to make use of a cycle in that size. I, I would recommend if you are making a first-time investment in a, a dust collection system, uh, going one of two ways. You can go with your very own second stage dust collector, which means buying a Vortex that we have on the floor, buying a Onita Dust Deputy, and attaching that to a barrel or a container of your choice, uh, and then having the adequate hosing to run to your dust collector, or buying a dust collector that has that Vortex built in. Uh, I know Jet makes one that we have on the floor. Uh, we have a Laguna that we use in the Dream Shop. It's a one and a half horse. It's got the Vortex built in. It's got the canister for about, I think, 18 gallons of storage debris underneath. And it's got a bag with a filter for the other particulates. So you've got the big particulate, you've got the small particulate, and then you've got what gets caught by the filter before it comes out. I think it's a one micron filter. And that's, that's $1,000 for that, but that is everything that you would need for the stages. And that does a few things. Having the second stage um, preserves the life of your dust collector. Uh, and that's very important. You don't want to buy a dust collector and then two years later have to buy another dust collector, especially if you've put out a good deal of money, usually between four and $700 on a dust collector. That's, that's a big chunk of change to have to throw out or get repaired uh, or replace. And so buying, again, buying right the first time and doing the research and getting something um, that's an all-in-one or getting something that you can set up a second stage on uh, is helpful. And having enough CFM. We sell a wall-mounted dust collector, and it's probably fine for shop cleanup. It's probably fine for having a sander close by. But it's not a good all-purpose total shop dust collector. It's just not going to work. Because um, once you start running a long hose from it, You've dropped the suction that you that you had at the at the source down significantly because you're not going to run a straight tube without any uh, any undulation in it like you would with a flexible hose. You can't run a straight tube because it's rigid, so it's you know inadequate. You can't do it. You can't store it. It doesn't work. So it's a flexible hose, and that cuts down on your suction. And so having a big enough dust collector really is important uh, when you do that. And the the cardboard barrel works like a charm. And you can find the barrels for fairly cheap. I mean, I got mine at Tepper Electric where I worked at the time. I said, hey, 
are you using this? And they're like, no. I was like, okay. That was it. I took it. You know, they didn't say anything to me. And they may charge you five, ten dollars if you go by there to get one. Um, and then they usually have a plastic lid. They have a seal for it. And so you can invest in the Vortex, which is usually just two pieces that go right into the lid that you cut a hole in. Or you get the dust deputy, put a gasket on there, attach it to it, and you're good to go. Anybody else? What about the dust bunny? Uh, you know, stuff that you, you know, like, like that. The, oh, sure. The lock on it. Yeah. They play good. Yeah, they'll work just fine. They're, 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 the Vortex and the dust deputy, they, they use the same basic principle, which is a cyclone. Yeah. I mean, all you really want from that second stage um, is to get the biggest particulate. You know, if you're doing a, any joining or planing, you have a lot of big particulate coming through that hose. That's going to gum up your motor. It's it's not going to help uh, your dust collector whatsoever. So yeah, that one is going to work just fine. I believe it. It's got two separate parts, yeah. and so it's got a it's got a cyclonic thing. So what happens is the weight of the debris that comes through and into that second stage drops immediately, and then uh, some of the the little smaller stuff will kind of float around at the top. And the very small stuff will go through onto the dust collector. And usually that's passed through the dust collector without any real issue. So yeah, that's perfectly fine. And pretty small and, and, and compact. You can move it out of the way pretty easily. Anybody else? See it, I guess. I was watching a YouTube video, Norm Abram setting up a workshop. Sure. He did that. He says, I like to have plywood as my wall covering. Uh -huh. Break it around. Sure. Because you could just screw in anywhere. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have to worry about finding a stud. Yeah. Um, uh, I found it with where I'm working as a garage, and I painted it white. Uh huh. In painting it white, it really helps brighten things up to the point where uh, we did it on a trailer first. We sure. Trailer that just had a plywood interior. We just we painted it white, and it's amazing how large it looks. Number one, number two, it's amazing how much light that you get in. Yeah. So if, if you're setting up a shop for the very first time, I don't know what uh, maybe get plywood and paint it white. Yeah. No, plywood's a great option, and yeah, obviously we didn't talk about wall coverings because I don't know what your shops look like, but. You know, if you have an uninsulated shop in the garage, it's just studs. You have a perfect opportunity to, to you know, put some insulation in there and put, you know, plywood up or OSB or something like that. Probably some AC plywood you get from the lumber yard, so you have the the A side out. You're not spending an arm and a leg on cabinet grade plywood uh, for it. But yes, definitely reflectivity is is very important. Um, painting it white. Uh, like uh, Mr. Holmes said, it can do a lot for you in getting more light into the room and having to invest in fewer light fixtures as well. Uh, some people may like a more rustic look, but as you get into darker colors, that abs that's absorbed more light. You may go from 90% reflectivity on your walls and ceiling with white to like 70% reflectivity. So all that light, all those lumens, if you invest in a high bay, you know, consider 30% of that gone if you have a dark colored wall. And that means more fixtures to get the same kind of light you would have had had you just painted it white. Okay. Any other questions? We'll adjourn, and then you guys can uh, mob me with questions afterwards if you have any. All right. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, this will be online. We did a Google Hangout, and we recorded this. So if you want to revisit it at any point in time, that's fine. And you can always find me here or any of us here at the woodshop. Uh, we're more than happy to help you out uh, and help you set up shop and find a way that suits not only your need but your budget. You know, uh, a lot of the enjoyment you get from woodworking is being, you know, economical uh, and being able to enjoy the project and not have to invest an arm and a leg in the tool. Will I sell you a three thousand dollar eight inch helical head joiner for Powermatic? Yes, yes, I will. But I will also sell you a $300 Steel City 6-inch benchtop joiner because if that's going to help you get the project done and that fits in your budget, then that's what you should get. There's no, no need to, to spend $50,000 on a shop unless you have the ability and you have the need. So there you go. All right, thanks, guys.